Good morning. Welcome to this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. And today, well, we're going to hear what the life in Christ looks like. Uh, uh, Paul will paint a picture of that for us, and it is a beautiful picture. A couple of announcements today. Uh, please stay after. Uh, we are celebrating Ed today. He is now retired after 20 years of service as our custodian, uh, and so we will enjoy uh, some cake, and uh, we'll get to share some memories uh, after worship today, so please stick around today. Uh, in addition, next week is Rally Sunday, and we will be having worship down at Riverside Park, uh, and the kids will be meeting their Sunday school teachers next week. Uh, so please come. We'll be having a potluck. Uh, and uh, so if you're interested in participating, uh, there is a list of uh, A to Z, what people should bring. I mean, we all like desserts, but sometimes we wind up with all or mostly desserts. So uh, please uh, bring a dish if you can. And this Wednesday, both confirmation and choir are going to be kicked off. So uh, we'll be starting our new year exciting. With that, let us begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our entrance hymn from the Lutheran Book of Worship, page 480, is, Oh, that the Lord would guide my ways.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy ha- for the for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you know our problems and our weaknesses better than we ourselves. In your love and by your power, help us in our confusion, and in spite of our weakness, make us firm in faith. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We will now hear our lessons. Our first lesson is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I'm commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray and bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. 
Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the God, Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Here ends the first reading. We will read responsibly Psalm 1. Happy are they who do have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of the sinners, nor sat in the seat of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff, which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when the judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. The second lesson is from Philemon, verses 1 through 21. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker. To Aphia, our sister. To Archippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, I am bold enough in Christ to command to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love, and I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed very useful to both you and me. I am sending him that is place I am sending him that place during my imprisonment for the gospel but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever no longer as a slave but more than a slave a beloved brother especially to me now that you have more to me, but in flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh in my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Here ends the second lesson. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to war, wage war against another king, 
will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is neither fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. They throw it away. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So you may have been a little confused listening to the second lesson if you were reading along because I changed the version uh, and apparently uh, he got the old one, not the new version, which I preferred uh, because I thought it was truer to the translation. But So that is what I will be preaching on, an entire book of the Bible, well almost. You heard 21 out of 25 verses that make up Paul's letter to Philemon. Philemon is one of five one-chapter books in the Bible. This little letter from Paul shows us how Christians should deal with each other. It tells us about grace, mercy, kindness, and forgiveness. It's a demonstration of the power of God to restore relationships Paul's letter to Philemon may be a short story, but there is a lot here about how the gospel transforms us. Now, there are three main people who feature prominently in this epistle. I've already mentioned two of them, Paul and Philemon. The third character in our story is Onesimus. Let's look at each of them and see how the gospel of Christ was changing them and their relationships. First, Paul, who we know the most about, how the gospel of Christ changed the direction of his life. Paul, first known as Saul, started out as a violent persecutor of the church. But then the Lord called Paul, dramatically throwing him off of his horse and blinding him, and he was converted. He became a believer in Christ. And Paul went from then from being a persecutor to a preacher, from an enemy of the gospel to an apostle, the greatest preacher, teacher, theologian, and missionary the world has known other than Christ. The gospel made such a big change in Paul's life that he himself was willing to be persecuted for the sake of Christ. And so it was after many years of missionary journeys and tireless labors all around the Mediterranean world that Paul was arrested and imprisoned. Paul's writing this letter to Philemon from Rome under house arrest sometime around the year 60 AD. During his imprisonment, Paul met Onesimus, who was from Colossae, a city in Western Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And Onesimus was a runaway slave. Unlike slavery in the American experience, race had little or nothing to do with slavery in the first century AD. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, slaves could as easily be Caucasian as darker-skinned. Some people even sold themselves themselves into slavery for a time to pay off debts. Slaves would not necessarily be harshly mistreated, but if a a captured slave proved to be trustworthy, he could be given a good deal of responsibility and eventually earn his freedom. However, if a slave disobeyed his master, or showed himself to be untrustworthy or ran away and was caught, he could expect to be punished. Escaped slaves could be whipped, burned with an iron rod, or even be put to death. And those who helped him could be in trouble as well. 
When Paul preached to him the gospel, Onesimus became a believer. Paul became his spiritual father, regarding Onesimus as his child in Christ, since it was through Paul's ministry that Onesimus was reborn as a new creature, a Christian. That's why Paul refers to him as my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Their relationship was so close that Paul calls him my very heart. But now, what would become of Onesimus? He was a Christian, and he'd been staying in Rome, but his home was in Colossae, and he needed to go back. As a runaway slave, what would his master do to him when he returned? His master back in Colossae was the other man, the third man, Philemon, who was a Christian. In fact, Philemon became a Christian, surprise, through the ministry of Paul. And as Paul mentions, Philemon has been share, bearing the fruits of faith, showing love to those around him, and even hosting his church in his home. Now, Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon, the master from whom he had run away, with this letter in which Paul intercedes for Onesimus and appeals to Philemon on his behalf. Now, Paul is counting on the power of the gospel to transform the relationship of Philemon and Onesimus from that of offended master and disobedient slave to brothers in Christ. Paul writes that he wants Philemon to have Onesimus back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. That brotherly bond in Christ would transform the relationship of Philemon and Onesimus. And this transforming power of the gospel also shaped how Paul appeals to Philemon. Paul, by rights, as an apostle, could have ordered Philemon to do what he said. Instead, Paul appeals to Philemon in a spirit of gentle persuasion so that Philemon, of his own volition, would let love and forgiveness direct his actions. So we see here in this letter how the gospel transforms relationships the relationship of Paul to Onesimus, that of spiritual father and child, the relationship of Paul to Philemon, Paul appealing to him as a brother rather than ordering him as a superior, and the hoped-for relationship now of Philemon to Onesimus, brother to brother, not just master to slave. What empowered those transformed relationships was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the same gospel and the same power that will transform our relationships, how we treat one another in the body of Christ, in the family of God, in the church. Our lives will be different because we're Christians. It happened in the lives of Paul, Onesimus, and Philemon, and it will happen in our lives as well. Love, mercy, grace, forgiveness, they're not just words on a page. They are realities in our lives. They are the ways in which we treat our brothers and sisters in the church. We are a family. We live in close relationship, but we are not without sin. We're not perfect people. We can each think of times when we failed to share the love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness that we have received. Times when we've demanded our pound of flesh rather than turning the other cheek. Yet still, Christ forgives us. We ourselves are constantly receiving forgiveness from Christ, and this is how we learn to forgive one another. We learn the joy of restored relationships, for God has restored us back to himself through our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And so you can see in the way that Paul writes to Philemon the love and grace that Paul had learned from Christ. It's demonstrated in how Paul appeals for Onesimus. He intercedes for Onesimus just as Christ intercedes for us. Jesus is our advocate before the Father, like Paul was an advocate for Onesimus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul now, now shows the love he learned from Christ. Likewise, Paul demonstrates a sacrificial love for Onesimus, even offering to cover any debts that Onesimus may owe Philemon. Paul writes, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Charge it to my account. Isn't this just like our Savior Jesus Christ who covers all of our debts before God? Yes, Jesus did indeed pay the price we owe, all our debts before God, when he shed his holy and precious blood for you and for me on the cross. It is finished, Jesus cried, paid in full. All your sins, dear sisters and brothers, all of the ways in which you have done wrong and offended God and hurt your neighbor, Jesus says of that whole thing, that whole mountain of debt, charge it to my account. And with that debt fully paid, fully forgiven, now you are freed from your bondage to sin and death, free to love, free to serve, alive in Christ, part of God's family, which will last forever. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O oh God, our King, you counted the terrible cost of our salvation 
and sent your Son to give his life on the cross. Inspire our hearts to trust fully in his sacrificial victory, that we would follow in his way through death and into eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine Shepherd, you give life to your church through your holy word. Grant your people always to walk in your way and receive your blessings as they serve you in this world and in the life to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you are our life and length of days, and you set before us your gift of life in your holy word. Preserve your institutions of marriage and family. Guard husbands and wives, parents and children, both from despising and from idolizing one another. Instead, let every relationship in the home exemplify your unconditional love for us in Christ and grant that all might follow him in their service to one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, preserve us from the ways of the wicked and prosper us in your paths. We commend to you all who bear office in our land and ask you to make them a blessing to those they serve. Grant to us every joy in the calling you have given to us, that we might render service to you in our works of love toward our neighbor. Remember those in need of honest labor and daily bread, and give them gainful employment according to your good and gracious will. And shower your blessings upon Ed Meidel now as his calling to be our custodian has drawn to an end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, give the strength of the Spirit to all who are suffering or in any kind of need, and especially to those who we have been asked to remember, including the family of Ruth Kaseforth, Marsha Schiller, Sherry Fanger, and Kyler Zilke, that they may all have the courage and will to take up their crosses and follow the Savior through suffering into the joys of life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have set before us life and death, blessing and curse in your holy word. Now at the altar, through his own word, your Son sets before us his own body and blood. Grant that all who receive the sacrament today might do so with prepared and penitent hearts, rejoicing in your gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation for the sake of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve us, O Lord, from all temptation and grant us faith that we may rest all our prayers and the desires of our hearts in your merciful arms. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us briefly share Christ's peace with one another. Uh, we collect our offerings uh, in the narthex, but now we will sing our offering hymn. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. 
Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who rose beyond the bounds of death and on this day, as he had promised, poured out your spirit of life and power upon the chosen disciples. At this, the whole world exults in boundless joy. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come, for all is ready. Just a brief word about our Holy Communion. Uh, There is a hand sanitizer here at the front. Uh, You will receive uh, the body and blood of Christ. There are waste paper baskets on either side, and the ushers will guide you down. We'll start with uh, this to my left and then the right side.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Receive now this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn from the Lutheran Book of Worship, page 509, is Onward Christian Soldiers.